Good morning. Good morning, bro. Good morning. It is a thrill to be here this morning. Uh, it's always, uh, always happy to have an opportunity to preach God's word, but this particular topic is very exciting because this is really this whole month what we're doing is really what it's all about being a Christian spreading the gospel so uh, I've been excited about this I've been telling uh, people I've been in the laundromat passing out flyers uh, been in the Walmart and McDonald's and telling all my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ as well uh, uh, trying to get people excited and get people to hear a portion of God's word. Uh, of course, as Anthony mentioned, I'll be here next week uh, uh, doing a sermon uh, on becoming a Christian. So I had to slice a lot of uh, what I had for that les lesson out of this lesson. Uh, and it's still 11 pages long. <laughs> but I'm always mindful of the time because God says we're supposed to do things in an orderly manner. And uh, when I used to preach at the Gloucester Church of Christ, uh, a friend of mine, Glenn Hitchcock, once said, uh, uh, you got 30 minutes, and uh, if you don't finish in 30 minutes, they got a trap door up there. <laughs> so, uh, but I've always uh, tried to be conscious. Now, after next week, I'm going to be in South Carolina. I was invited to go to the Sunset Church of Christ, uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard Church of Christ in South Carolina and Columbia. So after next week, I'll be gone. And, uh, as I was telling Clark before service, uh, I was uh, in Dearborn this weekend. It looks like I'm going to be leaving Jackson College and going to Henry Ford uh, this uh, semester. So I'll be doing a bunch of driving up there. But uh, as usual, I'm going to start this morning's sermon uh, with... Uh, 1 uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 11. And every scripture I'm going to give you is the King James Version. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability with, with God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom praise and dominion forever and ever. Uh, when you have an opportunity to preach God's word, you, we, you, me, we, everybody that stands up here, job is to glorify God through Christ Jesus. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tim uh, doing the Lord's Supper and Anthony uh, uh, song leading this morning because um, Anthony essentially gave you the answer in the songs that he selected today. <laughs> but for, you know, so he gave you the answer uh, to the test before we even uh, got started. But um, Sorry, Brian. <laughs> this, the way the Lord does things a lot of times is uh, he would tell a story to help you to remember. And uh, that's what I'm going to do today. So if we had had a scripture reading this morning, it would have been 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12 because much of the lesson is going to come out of there. And you, if you're going to do Bible study with people, you need to get in the habit of opening up your Bible and saying, this is what the Bible says. Not what I say, not what my church says. This is what the Bible says. So if we look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, it says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Today's lesson is the solution to sin. Well, why do we need a lesson on the solution to sin? Because the world, and even some of our, bro our brothers and sisters in Christ, have become too casual with sin. If you go on YouTube, type in Church of Christ and Phil Donahue, you can see a program that came on the air a long time ago when Phil Donahue was in his heyday about the Church of Christ. It involved a member of the Church of Christ who had committed fornication. Now, she did not deny that she committed fornication. As a matter of fact, the elders uh, had called her and... Um, they were administering church discipline. Now, the problem came in is that she didn't like it. She didn't like the church discipline. She hired a lawyer. And that lawyer won a huge lawsuit, hundreds of thousands of dollars against the church uh, because they enacted church discipline on her. And what's interesting about that, as we got into the details of everything that, that went on, uh, uh, was her attitude. 
that even though she admitted that she did this, but she was upset with the church and, quote, blaming the church uh, for uh, making this sin, this particular sin, uh, uh, public. Now, Garland Elkins, uh, who is the director of media relations for the Church of Christ, if you didn't know we have one, we do. He's from the Memphis uh, Church of Christ, was the one on the show. And repeatedly, over and over and over and over again, Phil Donahue would uh, uh, go to him and say, well, what does the Bible say about this? And every single time, Garland Elkins would give him a scripture. And so by the end of the show, if you watch it, you'll see that sarcastically, they asked, he, Phil Donahue asked him a question at the end, and Garland Elkins, before he answers, he says, and I bet you have a scripture for that. You know, so that is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be ready to give an answer, whether it's in season or out of season. And we need to talk about the solution to sin because it was amazing. Even though everyone was aware that she did this, the majority of the uh, audience uh, uh, sided with uh, the attorney uh, and the court's ruling that the church had nothing to do uh, about it. Uh, the only thing I saw that I was disappointed in is that, uh, and it's easy for me to talk now, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty, but they focus too much on the woman, and I would have focused more on the rest of the body of Christ. Because in Matthew chapter 19, the Lord made it clear Ignorance of the law is no excuse. And he said that whoever sleeps with this person or marries this person themselves are committing adultery. So the focus stayed too much on the woman where I would have focused on the reason the church had to make this public was because anybody who engages with her now, they're risking their spiritual salvation. All of eternity. You know, that's simply what the Lord said. So we talk about the solution to sin. And uh, because, like Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man. It seems right. But the end thereof is death. And uh, oftentimes, we're, we're guilty of it. See, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, not for us to steal. See, a lot of people, you know, say, oh, we're under the new uh, 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 covenant, so those things in the old, uh, those, those old uh, in the Ten Commandments, uh, Although they don't apply to us. Well, nine out of ten are in the New Testament. And one of them is not to steal in Ephesians 4.28. But many of us will illegally download movies uh, 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 or purchase bootleg copies of stolen movies uh, uh, from our friends or co-workers. And then uh, many of us will steal office supplies and try and justify it. Stealing is stealing. If you didn't pay for it and they didn't give it to you, then it's stealing. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Uh, yet, all we have to do now is turn on the television set and uh, uh, you hear profanity on not just cable TV, but now network uh, television. And also, sadly, uh, uh, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it has to be just ignorance of not knowing exactly what profanity is. The term uh, uh, come, uh, profane originates from the classical Latin profanus. Literally, before or outside the temple. It carried the meaning of desecrating what is holy or with a secular purpose. As early as 1450 CE, profanity represented secular indifference to religion or religious figures, while blasphemy was more offensive attack on religion and religious figures considered sinful and a direct violation of the Ten Commandments. Profanities, in the original meaning of blasphemous profanity, are part of an ancient tradition of comic cults which laughed and scoffed at deity or deities. <clears throat> so we need to stop using uh, profanity. The Bible says no fornication in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication. Yet many of us have been convinced that it's okay to fornicate. So one of the first solutions to sin is to know the will of God. Well, why is that important? Why did I repeat the will of God three times? Well, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, says that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So there's the reason right there. God gets to decide, as we studied uh, uh, about covenants this morning, uh, what the laws are, what the rules are. 
And here our Lord is telling us, he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven, even though they're calling him Lord. And as well, we already covered in previous classes, there's a difference between believing in the Lord and being disobedient, believing in the Lord and being obedient. You see, you can go to a funeral after <coughs> funeral. It doesn't, you could have a man that butchered 35 people, raped 10 women, and you'll have somebody preaching, well, he's up in heaven now. We know the Lord forgave him. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. I, I was told that Jeffrey Dahmer uh, accepted the gospel before he died. And just like the 11th hour uh, sinner, then yes, he can be. But if he didn't do what God told him to do, if he didn't do the will of God, then no. No, he did not. Uh, and no does anyone get in unless they do the will of the Father. And you're not going to fool God. Some of us think we're going to outsmart God. Uh, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, and whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth of the Spirit uh, shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So you're not going to fool God, one way or another, spiritually, physically. But let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So keep on. Keep on doing what's right. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. Treat your brothers and sisters in Christ. Make them a priority. It's especially those of the household of faith. So the reason I ask you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12 is because we're going to look at an example in that chapter that has God enacting what he said he would do. Uh, 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 an individual, a godly individual, reaping what he has sown, but it's also an example of mercy and grace of God. And it also ha contains several of our solutions to sin. So let me begin in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and did eat of his own meat, drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter, a family member. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take his own flock and his own herd, to dress with the way, wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. So what does that mean? It means the man, the poor man came to the rich man's house. The rich man wanted to feed him, but, he, but rather than take from his massive supply, he took his one and only lamb. That's like me inviting you over to my house for dinner and telling you to bring the food. Or reaching in your wallet and saying you will pay. No, I invited you to come fellowship with me. Otherwise, you could stay at your house. Why <laughs> you don't come over to my house if we're not eating the food that I prepared? Verse 6. Well, verse 5. Now, David has heard this, and this is his response. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this shall surely die. So here is knowledge that David understands right and wrong, just like us. Just like those, even those that don't come to church, they have a basic understanding of right and wrong. So the response that he gets, or well, David now is ready to dish out punishment. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. No pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Now David is having a, what? <laughs> yes, it's you. That's right. Yeah, he told the story. David gets all righteous and finds out it's him that has abused the